I look back at what felt like relative success, you know, like I never thought that I was taking over the world or anything, but I felt excited about it. And now instead it reads as like relative failure. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set. I want to play something for you. I took you to the place where I was born. You said that it was just as I described. We moved in soon. After the days turned warm Just in time to see the spring arrive You're hearing In the Time We've Got by the 1AM Radio, the artist name of this week's guest, Rishikesh Hirwe. A Massachusetts native, Rishi created the 1AM Radio while he was in college and went on to release four albums and several EPs and singles. The project's blend of literary, tuneful songwriting, lush arrangements, and experimental production found a following through touring as well as key placements in film and TV. Aside from his work as the 1AM Radio, Rishi created the incredibly popular and engaging podcasts Song Exploder and The West Wing Weekly. He also works as a composer for film and TV. I spoke to him in downtown Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Rishikesh Hirwe. You had the city in you Always in the way you moved With the skyline in the avenue What's the first thing that went through your head this morning? Same thing that it goes through my head many mornings, which is why did I wake up before my alarm went off? What time is your alarm set for usually? 7.30. And how, how much earlier did you wake up? I think it's like 6.50. So what's the answer? Stress. <laughs> I'm just like an, an, an unending, you know, clock whirring in the, whirring in the upper chamber there. A clock like you're worrying about deadlines for various projects? Yeah, just or like, like existential dread? Like more you like only ex- have <laughs> so many days left to live? I think more uh, a clock like more in the sense of just a machine that won't turn off. And so I'm thinking about like, oh yeah, what's the thing that I'm, that I'm behind on specifically? And then, yeah, and then existentially as well. When you think about yourself talk, like what the, the dialogue going on in your mind... Is it mostly um, positive or self-critical? Oh, it's definitely self-critical. What are the kind of things that you think about? I think about, I think of just to think about all my shortcomings. Is that productive? In some, in some ways, I think it is. I, I like, I hate exercising, but I finally like made a commitment to try and actually do that and uh, negative reinforcement has really been working on me because like I just I hate the way that I look and so and it and it's been a good enough motivation to get me to actually go exercise every day I wonder if it would be even more productive if you got some sort of joy out of exercising rather than we're doing it because you didn't like the way you look yeah that's probably true but as far as I can tell, there is no joy for me to be found in, in <laughs> exercise. If you can find joy in it, then you really win, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, th- there are people who love it or like who like get, you know, th- they talk about the endorphins and the runner high and I don't have any of those things. I'm a weird person in the sense that I love it, but if I'm not in the midst of it, then I get lazy. It's like, I, I'm like a pendulum. Well, not even a pendulum. It's, it's just like I'm somebody that thinks in a binary kind of way. And mm-hmm. if I'm in the midst of exercising and I have the momentum going, you know, I can spend years and be in great shape, but I'm, I'm thinking about the last couple of years in particular, since I moved downtown, I couldn't find a gym that I liked. That was like my excuse anyway. Yeah. And so I'm, and I've been working a lot. 
so I've totally backslid. <laughs> but anyway, um, so you grew up in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Where'd you grow up? Uh, that town called Peabody. What did your parents do? My dad was a food scientist, and my mom worked at Sears. What did she do at Sears? Um, she worked in. She like answered phones for the uh, for like. She was in. It was called credit approval. So basically, somebody would try and like m- m- buy something or like open up a credit card or use a, something like that, and they would call into there and they would do like sort of live credit checks or something like that. Neither. I think that's what what it was. It was I was pretty young, so would you get all of your like back to school clothes from Sears? Yeah. And did you have siblings? Th- that was actually a big reason. The main oh, yeah. reason why she worked there was because discount. to get the employee discount for her clothes. Yeah. So how many kids were in your family? Just me and my older sister. And was your older sister an influence on you musically? Y- yes, in in some ways. Um she wasn't like a big music head when we were, when I was growing up. So, and I think that was an influence, like sort of the lack of influence was an influence, you know, like I didn't have a, she's super cool. She's my best friend, but she, but she's not, she wasn't like the cool older sibling the way that you might stereotypically think of. She was just, she was, she wasn't like check out joy division. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. No, she was, uh, she was just sort of like a normal girl in the suburbs. And so she listened to top 40 radio and that meant I listened to Top 40, 40 Radio. Um, and it wasn't until... What did your parents listen to? My parents listened to Indian music. Mm-hmm. And where are they from? My dad is from a, a town or a city called Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. And my mom is from... Hyderabad she, is like the tech capital of India. It now. is now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Microsoft is there. And my mom is from... She kind of moved around a bunch when she was growing up. But, um, but the town she's probably most connected to is Pune. Okay, cool. So did you guys mostly speak English at home? The way it usually worked was like, like my sister and I would speak English. My, my parents would speak Marathi, my, mm-hmm. especially my mom. My dad would speak English usually to us. My mom would usually speak Marathi to us, and then we would just, but we would answer in English. I spent some time in India um, scoring a film once, and I worked with a guy named Kersey Lord, who was um, an arranger and composer mostly in like the 60s and 70s and early 80s. Yeah. He had retired, but we got him to come out of retirement to work with us on a film project. Uh, and so I got deep into, you know, like Artie Berman, S.D. Berman, yes. Lakshmi Kant, Piari Lal, Kalyanji, Ananji, all those great composers from like, uh, I guess it that was called the silver age of Bollywood composers. Well, SD Berman would have been the golden age and then RD would be the silver age, but yeah. it's, it's all, I like it cause it was like more experimental and crazier. Yeah. And they had brought in the Moog and like vibes and anyway, um, were you into that stuff when you were a kid? Yeah. My favorite is a guy named Opie Nair who was a golden age guy. Uh, he used to work a lot with Asha Bosley, who's mm-hmm. my favorite singer. She's your favorite? Yeah. I heard that Asha, when I was there, I guess Asha and her sister Lada yeah. had um, an, like an apartment or like adjoining apartments, except they never talked to each other because they were bitter enemies. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> I never heard that. I didn't know that. But I was there like 15 years ago, I guess it was. And even then, Asha was on like half of the stuff on the radio still. Yeah. yeah. And like the the parts that young woman women would be dubbing in in the films you right know? yeah so that was pretty cool yeah I, I think the session musicians there are even busier than the busiest session musicians in the states are <laughs> yeah. because they churn out more films right what i was told by kersey is that they would do one film in the morning and then have tea and maybe a little lunch and then do another film in the afternoon for like five to six days a week for decades that was the pace that they would go they were like the uh Bollywood version of the Wrecking Crew or something, right? <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, a bigger, bigger movie industry than Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, um, and, and the other thing I like about it is that it's kind of like what the American pop music industry used to be like when all the pop songs came from Broadway. Yeah, so it's all tied to a visual. Yeah, which is really cool. Yeah. And the other thing I like about it is there doesn't seem to be as much of like a generational divide. Um, it's just everybody listens to it. Mm-hmm. 
uh, that was my take on it anyway. But yeah, everybody know like everybody, young people, old people, everybody knows the words and the melodies to all the songs. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like they all know all the words, and you know some of the vocal stuff in those songs is pretty tricky and pretty. Um, you know, just the, there's there's a lot of not straightforward vocal maneuvering. And even just like people on, you know, like just not, amateurs who are just singing along, they can do that stuff. Yeah, like your rickshaw driver knows every single song. Exactly, and can sing along even though they're like so deftly sung. I just felt like it was a more musical culture. Like, you know, the kids that I met who were tabla players were playing at a level of musicianship that's higher than lots of professional American musicians. Yeah. And I feel like I felt that same way when I was, say, in Brazil mm-hmm. or in, in a fair amount of countries, actually, where just music is valued more. Or it's more woven into the culture than it is here. Hmm. Were you proud to be an Indian kid when you were growing up? Not really. Did you feel like it was a liability in any way? Yes. How so? Um, I mean, it definitely, it definitely made me an other, you mm-hmm. know. And and there was a part of me that was that liked being unique um, in my school, and you know, like in any context where I could be unique, I th- I, I saw that as something to enjoy. But it definitely. You know, it was just a, it was just a drag having people get my name wrong all the time or asking me, you know, ignorant questions. I remember, and then when I went to middle school, so I went to a pretty small elementary school, and the middle school was there were a lot more kids, and I remember one of the kids. There was suddenly now it wasn't just all all white kids in me, um, and there was another kid who was Japanese. Like his he had his family had moved from Japan. He was born in Japan, you know, he had a Japanese accent. And I remember one time somebody asked me if he and I were brothers. Yeah, I would say like the racists in Massachusetts are the most professional racists anywhere in the world. <laughs> oh, and they and they started me. I remember when I was So your school was pretty homogenous. Like there weren't even black kids in your class or Right. Huh, okay. Yeah. Um I remember I remember in when I was 6, like when I was pretty new at the, my, my elementary school, I transferred in, I skipped, I skipped a grade. Um, and so I went into first grade kind of a little bit late in the, in the school year, like not very late, like a few weeks in, Mm -hmm. but people that kind of already knew each other, Mm -hmm. they'd been in kindergarten together. So I kind of was like, anyway, I remember, uh, feeling a little bit like an outsider already. And then I remember a kid at kickball telling me I couldn't pitch because I was black. Wow. And what was your response at the time? Did you feel like you you were good at standing up for yourself? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I remember. Um, I remember feeling upset about it and feeling like, like there was a level of injustice to the whole thing. But at that time, I don't think I, you know, I was, I was so little, I wasn't very confrontational. Mm -hmm. I didn't like get into fights or or anything like that. I remember it also felt like a liability a little later too, when I was starting to like be interested in girls. Yes. It felt like a, a thing that precluded me in some ways from like even just consideration or something. And I, I was resentful about that. Yeah. You know, one thing I was thinking about or that I've thought about over the years is Aside from any kind of negative stereotyping, there weren't any like badass Asian characters on television or in film. I mean, other than, say, Bruce Lee, but he was kind of exoticized, if that makes sense, or, you know, the kung fu guys. But not on America, like in American cinema or television, there wasn't just like a Cosby show, but with Asian people when yeah. we were growing up. Yeah. Asian men were typically like effeminate. And I mean, we had Apu. Emasculated. Yeah, you had Apu. And uh, yeah, this was discussed on um, an episode of Master of None, actually. <laughs> it does, even if like, even if people are fair-minded and, you know, not consciously biased, I think that lack of representation or that weird representation seeps into people's consciousness. I remember when I was 15, so I left, I left that, I left the school system. I went to, to a private school. You went to Exeter, right? I went to Exeter. Yeah. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I remember coming back 
for the summer, like after my sophomore year and hanging out with a girl who I'd had a crush on in, you know, I still had a crush on her at the time, you know, but I'd had a crush on her for, for a few years. And I remember asking her like, um, you know, sort of with the relative safety of distance from, from when we were, when I actively was her classmate and had a crush on her. I was, I asked her, I was like, you know, back in those days, was it, was the fact that I was Indian? Was that like a thing that made it weird? Was that a barrier at all? Like, was that just in my head or was that actually a thing that made it hard to consider me as somebody who, you know, like for girls was, was that made, did that make it hard to consider me as somebody you'd be attracted to? And she answered me honestly. She said, yeah, I think it did. Or I think it does. Which also means that it was in your head too, because I mean, if it's, if it's real with one person, then moving forward, you're thinking about it as a barrier. Yeah. Even if it isn't with somebody else. Yeah. What kind of music were you listening to when you were in high school? In high school? Everything. I was like a complete sponge. Anything, anything that I could listen to, I, there were no, no boundaries. So I, I listened to uh, so much stuff. I, I remember there were like cooler kids in, in high school who kind of made fun of me for it. That, that like that I they sort of thought that I was into anything that had any kind of like pop sensibility regardless of what it was but um but really I was just like yeah I, on this show I talk a lot about how music was more of a social signifier back then mm-hmm. and it seemed like you had to choose something at the exclusion of other things yeah but you didn't make that choice you just I liked everything had the confidence to like everything I mean the thing the things that I would the things that I would sort of represent i guess would be more like you know it was like minor threat and fugazi and uh um sort of like post hardcore was my was a lot of the stuff that i was i felt most connected to maybe i think partly because of like because of that because i felt like that was mine like i felt that felt like especially at exeter there weren't a lot of people in that space and it felt like i felt really tied into it but i would listen to everything i mean i, I really i liked uh you know, I was just, just learning about so much stuff. I felt like after coming, how were you learning about it? Um, I mean, so I lived in that, this dorm with like 30 boys and the kids were, came from all over the world and all over the country. And, and they just had totally different tastes and totally different backgrounds. And I would just go and, you know, talk and people would lend me CDs and I would listen to stuff and I would tape, you know, I had a little, um, CD tape deck and I would just make t- mixtapes of, of whatever my favorite song was from whatever the CD was. And, and so I had these, you know, this was a little bit before I g- understood the, uh, the art of the mixtape mm-hmm. and, and really like curating something that had like a good flow to it. And I would just, just put stuff on. So it would jump around a lot, but they were just these sort of catch-alls of, you know, anything. So, like, you know, kids in, my, kids in the dorm would listen to... Like I had one other friend who was into like punk stuff in the dorm. And then, um, I gotta imagine there would have been some deadheads. In oh your dorm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of the, that was kind of the, the, the mainstream, the mainstream there was, was grateful dead and fish. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of related things like Bob Marley and anything that widespread might, panic. Not so much oh, okay. widespread panic, <laughs> but but anything that you would sort of associate with the hacky sack, a soundtrack to yeah to playing hacky sack. Yeah, yeah. Was hacky sack big at Exeter? It was. What about uh, Devil Sticks? Not so much. <laughs> no, but there was definitely like there was frisbee. There were maybe one frisbee for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you wind up there? Did you just kind of exhibit exemplary talent when you were in? public school and decide and like get a scholarship or something or what happened? I did get a scholarship, but it was, but uh, the idea actually came from my sister. She was old enough that, you know, she went to college. My sister had been sick a lot when she was in, when she was in school. Um, and she, she went to college after having, you know, she graduated in the top 10 of her class, but she had missed like half of the school year. And, but she was still able to like maintain her GPA enough that she graduated in the top 10. She got to college, and she felt like utterly unprepared for what what she. Where did she go there. to school? She went to Emory. Okay. And so she pretty early on said to my parents, "I was not prepared for this. You need to get Rishi out of 
the Peabody Public Schools and send him somewhere else so that he can do better when when he goes to college. Send him somewhere where he can pitch on the kickball team. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then my my parents started looking around and I applied to a couple of schools and then we had a family friend, another Indian friend whose son was a year old or a couple of years older than me, but he was in the grade ahead of me. And he was a, a freshman at Exeter at the time. And there was Exeter and then Andover was really close to where I grew up. And so those were sort of the two the two top choices. So I applied to both of them and then I got in but but Exeter gave me a full ride. And so I, I wanted to go there anyway because it meant I would be able to live away from home. Um, I was excited about that. And over, I would have lived at home. Did you not like living at home? I just It just seemed exciting to me, the mm-hmm. idea of, of, uh, of going away. Mm-hmm. I was ready, I think, for, for that kind of adventure or something. And you were still a year younger than everyone. So you were 13 when you went to high school? Yeah. Were you playing an instrument at that time? Yeah, I was playing... I was playing piano and I just started to play the drums. Um, I started playing drums in, in eighth grade a little bit. And then I went, I, uh, I went to school and Exeter was so, they were so good to me. I mean, like in addition, like in addition to a full ride for the sort of the tuition, they also gave me like a scholarship for the, um, for, for like piano lessons. They had, I had to apply for it, but they had, um, they had financial aid for, for music too. So I took, piano lessons um and those were subsidized and i took piano lessons with the jazz teacher who was in a band with the drum teacher from from the high school and i asked him and there was a ro- there was like a practice room um in the music building that had a drum kit and i asked him if there was a way i could like get access to that room and so he asked the drum teacher and he gave me a key and so usually that room was reserved for people who were taking drum lessons so i was the only person who wasn't taking drum lessons from that teacher who had access to it and so i would just go in there and and play drums along with your fugazi records your tapes my tapes absolutely it was fugazi 13 songs it was fugazi helmet and who else would i play the drums to um um there's a third record on there i think it was i think it might have been godfather by ned's atomic dustbin sounds about right yeah we're talking like 93 right yep yeah, that sounds about right for that era. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have ambitions to become a professional musician at that time? No, not at all. I didn't even actually know that that was a thing that somebody could become. Did you feel like music brought you a type of joy that you wouldn't get from anything else, or was it just another activity? No, that was like, I, for me, I felt like music was, I mean, you know, music was my life. It felt, I think I had a typical teenager's relationship to music where I was just like, this is the... Th- place where I am understood it is able to say all the things that I can't say and ex- express feelings and connect me to things and introduce me to feelings that I didn't know didn't know about it was everything did you start a band in high school I, I didn't start a band you know that was, was one thing that was weird about about Exeter was it was like more about cover bands there were a lot of cover bands like sort of the big mode of performance outside of classical recitals was playing, you know, playing in front of the school and doing like your version of a Led Zeppelin song or something like that. And uh, so I got, I remember the first time I played drums, you know, in front of people was, I had been, I had been recruited to play drums for, for this guy who wanted to cover a Smashing Pumpkin song. Which one? Today. Did you nail it? I don't know. <laughs> I remember I didn't. That's a good own, drummer right there. <laughs> I didn't own uh, proper drumsticks. Um, what did you use? I I, uh, I had to. I ended up having to borrow drumsticks um, to to play. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was pretty early on, so I didn't even have have my own drumsticks. So when you think back to that time, what did you envision your life would be like when you were forty years old? I don't know. Do you think that you're the kind of person that thinks ahead like that or not? Yeah. I I think at that point, at that point, I think I really, I, I felt like I was, I think at that point I was old enough to know that I, I had like outgrown some of my foolish 
childish dreams maybe a little bit, but, but I didn't yet know what I had settled on. What were your foolish childhood dreams? Well, I mean, it's still my dream, <laughs> um, but I, my dad showed me recently this, you know, thing that I'd written in fifth grade where they were like, what are you, you know, picture what you're doing, what's your life going to be like? And I said that I was going to be a cartoonist and I was also going to do voiceover for cartoons. And I would still like to do that. I would, I would, I mean, I, I've given up on the being a cartoonist part, but I would still love to do voiceover for cartoons. That's still like just a really deeply held dream of mine. What are your favorite cartoons? Uh, now? Yeah. Now, Adventure Time's probably number one. Does that count? It's, it's over now. But, yeah. uh, I thought, I thought the, uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, and Legend of Korra series was really great, too. And we were talking about Food Wars earlier. Oh, yeah, Food Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, Bob's Burgers is amazing. Mm-hmm. Bojack Horseman is one of the best TV shows ever made. I don't know if that, if that counts as a cartoon. It's just, it is, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah like, I, like I... Have you ever pe- pursued it? You have a good voice. I have, I mean... I haven't pursued it in that like I I'm not an actor. I think you you need to be you need to be able to act to some extent. And now I think it's like I get I get I get sort of my version of it when I get to put on, you know, turn on the microphone and record stuff for podcasts. But yeah, if um if if the folks from Bojack ever wanted <laughs> me to do something, I mean, but it's just, you know. You could be a podcast a host on Bojack. Oh. Would what be. would your name be? It would be something similar to your name, but with an animal built into it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That would be incredible. <laughs> All right. We'll have to think of that. We'll, we'll, we'll let that marinate in no, our subconscious. You got it already. It's fishy case your way. Oh, there you go. Boom. Yeah. And that's why you got into Exeter. <laughs> Ooh, a fast mind. Nimble. Um, so you graduated from high school and, and then, you went to Yale, which is actually how I met you because you went to school with a good friend of ours, Jada, who's now writing for the Washington Post. Mm-hmm. And she used to have to listen to me play the drums. She Did you live together? She lived in the apartment downstairs from me when we, we I moved off campus. And she uh, lived in the same apartment building. And I had my drum kit in my apartment. And I, and I asked her and her roommate if it would be okay if I ever practice the drums and they said yes and so i would play the drums in my apartment which now just seems insane but i would and they they were cool with it beginning of high school I didn't know what I was going to do you know like when Mm -hmm. I was answering your question there but by the time I finished I thought I had an idea of what I wanted to do which was teach English I thought I I thought I wanted to even maybe return to Exeter and teach there Mm -hmm. I really loved it there I thought it was really beautiful and and I had really just it was an experience that I don't know I evolved so much there and and I really fell in love with it as a result and I had some pretty incredible teachers had a really incredible English teacher named Mr. Greer, and I and I had uh, taken philosophy classes uh, for the first time, which was I was like I didn't even know you could do this in high school, and both of those teachers, my philosophy teacher and my and Mr. Greer, Mr. Vorkink and Mr. Greer had both gone to Exeter for high school, gone to Yale for their undergrad, and then gone to Yale again for graduate school gotten their master's and then gone back to Exeter to teach. They both had these sort of like parallel paths in their different departments. And I kind of, and I, and I kind of worshiped Mr. Greer. I just thought he was the coolest. And so I thought maybe that's what I could do too. And so I kind of, not arbitrarily, but, but it was really only because of them that I picked Yale as the place that I was going to apply. I thought maybe I had maybe thought up until then that maybe I was like more technically minded or something. I think Mm -hmm. that again, this is the Indian part of it you know like everybody just assumes that you're gonna gonna be an engineer if you're not gonna be a doctor and i already knew i wasn't gonna be a doctor 
And so I was like trying to figure that out. And then it just, I realized I didn't like that stuff. I wasn't wired that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, so I applied. No one cares what you like, man. (laughs) (laughs) And so without telling my parents, I applied to Yale. That was a disappointment to them. Uh, It was just a surprise just because there was, there's not, it's, you know, it's not really like a, there's no engineering department to be, it's not MIT, you know, it's not. Did they put pressure on you to become an engineer? I think they, no, I think my, like my mom's dream would, was that I would become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I'm not going to do that. Then she was like, okay, that's fine. Lawyer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so at that point, I think they were just like, they weren't, it wasn't necessarily, oh, you're going to be an engineer. They were, they were more thinking that I would be a lawyer. Especially if you go to somewhere like Yale, that's a solid foundation in humanities. Then you can go on to law school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's but even before, even before Yale was in the picture. They, so they so like, you, you went into Yale thinking that you wanted to study you know, English, and, English philosophy. and philosophy. Yeah. And then what happened? I started realizing that the thing that actually made me happy was making stuff and literary criticism at Yale. That's really important. There is, is really about just commenting on works, you know, trying to find a new angle into a piece of literature or a film that probably 10 other people or a hundred thousand other people have already found and trying to write about it as opposed to just making your own thing. And now with Song Exploder, you're kind of on the line in between criticism and art. Right. You're making something, but it's also a platform for someone else's story. Yeah. And kind of examining it from a critical lens. Yeah. One of the reasons why why I wanted to do Song Exploder in the way that I'm doing it is, is I mean, I never ha- would have had the instinct to just be like, oh, I'm going to like write essays about somebody's records. I n- never had any interest in that. I only wanted to make stuff. And the real satisfaction of making Song Exploder for me is the part where I'm actually editing it and doing the thing that feels more like, it feels more like a remix. It feels more like a, like an, a creative endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm just, and I'm using somebody else's words and music as the ingredients to make this thing. Mm -hmm. It's probably, I don't know, but, but it feels like it's my thing that I'm making as opposed to, as opposed to what I was doing in college, you know, where you're writing, yeah, you know. Were you playing drums in a band in college? I was, yeah. What band? It was it was a band called Pinstripe, and it was my it was that was my my first band that like ever recorded anything and put you know released anything. I played drums and I also wrote songs. So so we would switch the guitarist and singer, the person who, he he played guitar and, and sang. My friend Webb. And my friend Carl played bass, and then I would play drums, and I would also sing, but then sometimes we would switch, and I would play guitar, and Webb would play drums. When you listen back to a pinstripe recording now, how does it make you feel? Well, the recording part makes me cringe a little bit, because because I remember I really wanted to... I had this weird aversion to reverb, the idea of using reverb in the recording. Like, it felt like like a path towards cheesiness or something like that, or like being fake. And I wanted it to, I really wanted it to sound like you're right there in the room with us. Yeah. Well, if you take the Fugazi model, not only is Ian not a big fan of reverb, reverb is kind of like mood, like colored lighting and Fugazi always plays with the house lights on. Yeah. And so a dry vocal is kind of like the equivalent of having the house lights on. Yeah. But we really, but there's also, but the thing is like reverb exists in the world mm-hmm. and recording studios are not the world. And so if you wanted to make, make something sound natural, you do actually have to use reverb a little bit, yeah. in a way that is tasteful. And I didn't really understand that. And so I, we went into record and I was like, no reverb on anything. Yeah. And so it sounds insanely tight and dry <clears throat> and, uh, and artificial and, and small in a way that I think doesn't, doesn't do justice to the songs. But are you able to enjoy it on some level when you listen to pinstripe There's or some... anything that you've recorded for that matter? Or do you only hear the flaws? I, I definitely hear the flaws. There are a couple things here and there and a couple songs that I think were good ideas. 
but usually that gets covered up by the flaw, by what I'm thinking about, of like how, how stupid that was or how misguided that idea was. What happened after you left college? Well, after, after, right after college, I went on my first tour um, with, my, with the 1AM Radio, which, was like a, which is my band now or my project now, which I'd started actually when I was in college. So like in, in 1999... That was when I started playing shows as the One Aim Radio, and I and I and I put out my first record, and I like. I started to you know want to leave school. Like there were there was a lot of bands on there were a lot of bands on campus, but they would just sort of play on campus, and I just wanted to get out into the world and like play for strangers. So I was trying to do that as much as possible, and by doing that, I ended up meeting people, and you know I, I played a show where I opened for Ted Leo and the Secret Stars. And um, and then Ted Leo, super nice. And afterwards, he was like, he was like, oh, do you have? He's like, do you have a recording? Do you have something that I can buy? And I was like, no. I was like, I have this pinstripe CD. <laughs> yeah, that has no reverb on it. Um, and I was like, but but that's it. And he was he was like, okay, well. He's like, what are these your songs? I was like, well, a couple of them I wrote. And he's like, well, I want I want what I just heard. And I was like, no, I don't have anything. And he's like, well, I live in Boston. If you're ever in Boston, you want to record something, let me know. And I was like, actually, I'm from Boston, so. I would love to take you up on that. And so, so I did. So then like over spring break, I went and, and recorded with him and, and, and then that ended up coming out as like the very first one name radio thing. It was a split seven inch with Ted Leo. Great. And this was the era when he was playing lots of shows by himself too. Yeah. Right. And he had like a reel to reel on exactly. stage. Yeah. I wonder if I saw the one AM radio back then at the <laughs> middle East or something. <laughs> Opening for the album leaf, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> so did you have ambitions of making that band like your your primary focus in life? Like did you want to make a living playing in a band or did you want to explore other things? I wanted to do that. That was the thing that made me the happiest and I thought was it was definitely like in terms of making stuff and, and finding the joy in that, you know, I was, I was an art major at that point and I really liked the visual stuff that I was doing, but for me it was kind of all funneling towards that. So like the, I was a photography major and a graphic design major. Those were my two concentrations in art. And, and then I made music and the one aim radio was like the place where all of it came together. Cause I would, you know, use the photographs that I took and then design the art for the artwork. And then I would design that with the words that I wrote and the music that I wrote, like that was just like, it was, everything was mine. It was the one thing that you were uniquely qualified to do and all of your influences kind of converged there. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wanted to, I wanted to do that, but I didn't understand really like how one could and definitely didn't think that it was be, it would be like a viable profession for me. So I graduated from school and then I left and I thought I was, and I would just, tried to get some work doing graphic design stuff because that was kind of even in school that was how I was making making my money was like like summer jobs and stuff was doing layout and design stuff like that so I got a job at, at a startup after so I went on tour mm -hmm. with the 1am radio for like six weeks and then I came back from the summer and then I, I started you know working <laughs> working a day job at like a uh, startup and then and then somewhere uh at the end of that year in December, I went on like another tour with one name radio. And after coming back from that, and that one was like the first time I came home with like, with money, any money at all, but it felt like such a success. You know, mm -hmm. I had enough money that I went and bought an eight track digital recorder from guitar center. And I was just like, this is it. A I, Roland. A Roland. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The VS 880. Mm -hmm. And that was it for me. I was like, forget it. Like I had had this idea up until then that I was going to, that I was gonna do my music wherever I could around making a living. But at that point I was like, no, music is gonna be what I do and I'll do whatever else I have to around that. But the, you know, even if the ratio, even if, if I'm doing the exact same thing tomorrow, in my head, I had flipped a switch. So I knew that like music was gonna be the number one priority and then I would just do whatever I needed to to survive and support that. And when did you come out to LA? Um, I came out here in 2002. Oh, wow. Okay. So that wasn't that much later um, that you came out here. Yeah. What brought you out here? I wanted to come out here. I actually wanted, I wanted to move to LA 
right after college. And so when we went, when I went on that tour, I went with my, with my friend and my friend Carl and, and I did the whole tour together, partly with an idea of like, well, we're going to take this tour out to California and maybe we can, I was sort of pushing him like, let's move to LA. And we went and we went to LA. We play, I played a show at the smell that had recently opened at the time. The one in the Valley or the one downtown, the one downtown. Okay. I opened up for a, a former Yale classmate. Oh, she was uh, ahead of me by a few years, but Mia Doy Todd got me the show because she lived in LA and I was like, what do you think? Can we move here? But it was a weird experience because we didn't actually stay in LA. We stayed down in Anaheim mm-hmm. or in Orange or something like that. So we didn't really get to experience it. And my friend was like, I don't really know. He, he kind of wasn't into it. So I was too chicken to move here by myself. So it took me a couple of years. I moved to New York instead thinking, oh, maybe I could make that work. But then I hated it. And then the girl I was dating at the time got into law school at UCLA and I was like, okay, here's like an external, external factor saying like, okay, let's do this. There's a, there's a reason to go, you know, there's a support system. And then my one friend who lived out, my one friend from Massachusetts who moved to California had been going to film school in Orange County and then he was moving to LA. So I knew he was moving to LA and then my girlfriend was going to go to law school. And so I was like, okay, time to move to LA. Do you feel like you eventually got to a point where living in LA was working out in the sense that you were able to explore all of the creative opportunities that you hoped to find? Yeah. I mean, I love being out here and that's the reason why I wanted to come was just that it felt like it, the, the feeling that the sky was the limit. And I mean, I have, I still haven't been able to do all the things that I want to do, but I know that they're here. What are some of the things that you wanted to do that you have done? Score films. Yeah, score films, score TV show. That was why I came out here. And and the the fact that I got to do that was great. You know, having songs in in films and in TV. Just being able to, like, make a living as a musician. Mm -hmm. Being able to say, like, okay, this is what I do. And I don't have to, like, have a side hustle as a graphic designer or something like that. Like, there was, uh, you know... When were you able to start dropping the side hustles. So 2007 was the first year that I was, that I like made my living as a musician. I toured a bunch that year and I produced a record. That was my first time producing a record. Which and record was that? It was for a band called Eulogies. Um, I guess that was actually like the end of 2006. We did in December and January, but I guess, no, yeah. January, 2007. Yeah. Um, so 2007 was the first year that I was like, I pay my bills from music and it just felt like the most incredible feeling. It had felt like I had made it home in some way. There was a one name radio record that came out that year. I did a, you know, like I said, I was touring a bunch. It was for this record that I had made between 2005 and 2006 when I wasn't living in LA. Cause I was here from 2002 to 2004. And then I left and was kind of like touring and drifting and, and I moved back home to Massachusetts for a little while to make a record so I could work without having to pay rent. And my, my parents weren't living in Massachusetts anymore, but the house was still there. And so I kind of just occupied it for, for a few months and tried to write and record there without the pressure of having a day job. But, but after it was all done, that record, the whole record was kind of about a feeling of displacement, like whether it was like, literal you know sleeping in in your car or something like that but just like a lot of like wandering and feeling like unattached in a in a not nice way and then i got back to la in 2006 and and just like having a home again just having like an apartment just like i remember going to ikea and getting a bookshelf and being like i have a bookshelf i can like put my you know i was basically living out of my car for two years not literally but for extended periods, you know, I was moving. Like couch surfing. And, yeah. I would yeah. be in a place for like three or four weeks at a time or, or, or a couple days at a time. And so it was whatever I could fit into a Honda Accord was what I had with me. And so when I got that bookshelf, I was like, now I can accumulate books again. Yeah. Anyway, so, so that had been this principal feeling for a couple of years. And so that year, that 2007, that record came out. And I have kind of felt like, oh, I closed that chapter. I, I've like, I felt like I've arrived home. And it was a home that I'd made for myself. Mm-hmm. So that felt really good. 
subsequently, have you ever felt like you've strayed from home again? <laughs> yeah. I, like sometimes I think I'm like, oh, is that, was that, the, did I peak <laughs> here? <laughs> really? I wonder, wonder about it Why? sometimes. I mean, it just, that, there was, that was a big year for me. Um, like I said, f- making, making a living as a musician for one, um, like enough so that like I had actually, I was able to, I was able to buy an apartment, apartment, a little one, but still I was able to like buy an apartment from music that I'm, from money that I made from making music. And then through music, I ended up meeting my now wife that year. That was also in 2007. Um, we met, we got engaged that year. Because as she told me, she was a fan on MySpace, correct? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of stuff happened and it just was like, it was euphoric in a way. And, uh, and I, and there haven't been a lot of times that I've felt that same way since. Is that circumstantial or is that something that you can control with your attitude? I think probably a little of both. I think the, the thing that changed is you have that first year of making your living as a musician and it's awesome. Then but you say your sights higher. Y- yeah. What, what, what eventually doomed that feeling was the idea that money and success were tied together, are tied together, which they're actually not, yeah. but they kind of are in a way it's in our culture, you know, it's easy to, it's easier to explain yourself if you're making a living doing what you're doing. Yeah. It's easier to just kind of navigate through the world. If you can say I'm a musician and people are like, Oh, what do you, what is, what's your real job? And you're like, no, I'm a musician. Yeah. But there isn't really a correlation between like artistic greatness and financial gain. Right. So it's a weird, it's a weird place to be once you've started making the money doing it. And then, then you're thinking, Oh, if I stop making money, does that mean I'm less of an artist or that I'm not really doing this or it's not real anymore? Yeah. I mean, for my parents who don't, understand anything about music the fact that i was making a living the fact that i was able to buy an apartment that was when i was able to show this is real what i'm doing like i've been doing you know for for many many years they were sort of like what are you doing Mm -hmm. when are you going to go when are you going to go to law school when are you going to sort of figure things out you know you're squandering your your potential and because they don't understand i can't tell be like mom got a good review on pitchfork <laughs> like she's like fuck that <laughs> she's more of it i'm she's kind more of with your mom on that yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway so they 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 needed that kind of i felt like i i was able to prove myself to them in some way by by having that but then yeah it's like well what what happens in the next year i don't have an album out i'm not touring so i was, I was like sort of thinking like oh well now if I start to do some design on the side again, am I failing? Am I like, am I, have I backslid by, uh, by doing that? And, and uh, yeah. And I was just, I think I was just so excited about the idea that, that I was making any money at all, like to, that I was able to survive from making music, that that was enough for me. But then, yeah, you have to go, go on and you're like, well now what? And, and I think I got a little bit more connected to the music industry in LA because of the label that I was on and, and just like the people I would meet through that. And it kind of infected me in a way, like I got away from sort of the, the DIY Fugazi feelings that I'd had and got more into this feeling of like, Oh, well, you know, how many sinks is this band getting? How many, you know, how many, like, like, things that I didn't think that bands cared about. I never th- thought about like ever getting my music on the radio, mm-hmm. but then suddenly there's like a whole radio promo department at the label. No matter how much I came from someplace different, I could see that that was like, those were the bands that were getting better opportunities, better resources, the chances to do cooler things. And so I started to feel like I had to think about that stuff. I had to try and comport myself in a way that would, lead to that kind of success. And do you feel like you could do that and still remain authentically yourself? I don't know. I don't know that I'm, I don't know that I'm good at making, (laughs) 
I don't know that I'm good at making music that a lot of people will like. Isn't that terrible? I feel like that's so terrible to be, to like. Unless you're deliberately trying to write music for top 40 radio. It's, it's not really something that you can consciously do. I mean, it, it has to be a byproduct and you have to get lucky. I know. And maybe, maybe your sensibility is resonant with the masses and that's just another product of luck. Mm-hmm. It's well, so funny. I was, re- I was listening to your interview with, uh, with Mimi from Low. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, a while ago. And, and I remember thinking about that then because there was a time for me where like Low was just it that Mm -hmm. was it that was the absolute pinnacle i loved them more than you know i just loved them so much and just thought their music was so beautiful and i and i just thought they were so successful and huge like just enormous to me they they loomed so large in my mind that i just thought they were enormous i saw them i saw them play uh at coolidge corner in Boston and they, the movie you know, theater. Yeah. And it was sold out and it was just beautiful. And, and I was just like, this is incredible. And I thought, I remember for a long time, I was like, if I could somehow just, I was like, I don't know what it is. I have no idea, like literally no concept, how much money low has to make to like do what they do. Or Yola Tango was another mm-hmm. thought. I was like, I was like, how much money does you to me? Yola Tango is like as success. Like they're so successful. And so great. I also know they're not like, they're not Justin Timberlake, but I'm like, whatever that is, like, can I get to that level? Is that comfortable? Like, I, I just want that. And so when I was listening to that, that episode, I was thinking about that feeling and how long it had been since I'd had that because there's this, I don't know, there's like a infinite greed or something, yeah. something that, that, ends up even though i don't didn't want it to infect me or in any kind of way i think just i was near it and it made me think that i had to write music differently or or basically what it really made me feel was like i'm just not good enough to be doing the thing that i do like i'm not good enough to make records which is why i haven't made records in a long time because i can't make records that everybody's gonna like but now i think about like somebody like lo who I still absolutely love, and I see them in the context of how the music industry might see them, and where, where what, how other people might think of them, and I realize, like, well, I mean, Lowe's so still so 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 successful, and so much more successful than ever I, I ever was. But uh, what am I trying to say? Just that I think I lost sight of. Uh, I also think about like I think about Christoph Kozlowski, who you know whenever I had to answer the difficult question of like, who's your favorite filmmaker? Like I remember being like, well, this is as good of an answer as I can give. I love his movies and thinking like, he's just like creatively the best. Mm -hmm. But then at some point realizing like how insignificant he must seem commercially, but that doesn't, that, but that never made a dent in how much I loved him. Mm -hmm. Never, Never made, it was never something I never thought I never looked up box office mojo to see how a Kozlowski movie was doing. You know, it just was irrelevant. But somehow I, I wasn't able to apply that same kind of thinking after a certain point to my own work. And I wonder if that's like a self-defense mechanism in your mind. It's because like it's easier to not try if you feel like, okay, well, my sensibility isn't going to resonate with the masses, so I, be- I might as well just not do this. Yeah. Instead of just being like, let me put my heart out there and see what happens yeah. and then do it again and then do it again. Yeah. Which is essentially what a band like low does. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they can fill a theater is kind of secondary. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mm-hmm. think that from my, like I don't get the sense that that's something that they are aiming towards. It's just the byproduct of being great yeah. and being essentially themselves. Like there's no other band that sounds like that. Yeah. But for me, the, the the current, like my favorite band now is nowadays is Grouper. I think about that, or I'm just like that is singular, and I just, and it feels like it is made with the intention of just like expressing a thing in a pure pure way, and I want to be able. I wish I could, I wish I could somehow 
lose some of those years. Like I think the reason why 2007 was so happy was because that was a record that I had made without any of those things being part of the consideration. I wasn't thinking at all about whether people are going to like the thing. I was just trying to make the thing that I wanted to make. Yeah. And then it also got to be, and I was also able to make a, a living out of it. The fact that those two things, and that was the only time those two things coincided. Because afterwards, I was able to still make a living making, you know, doing music or doing music related things. But it was never without, it was never without that same, it was never without some consideration towards like the commercial appeal. Yeah, and how I was falling short of it. Hmm. When your father's ghost came round, you bade him to please say, but he just slipped away. You cried all night in bed as I held your. Well, what was the impetus to start Song Exploder? I just, I thought it would be a good idea. Were you listening to other podcasts at the time? I was listening to a couple. I was listening to WTF with Mark Marin. Mm -hmm. I listened to that. I listened to Doug Loves Movies. And I listened to The Memory Palace. And I think actually all three of them play into the DNA of Song Exploder. But also, I remember around the time when I was start, first starting to make make my own records. I was listening, I was reading a lot of Tape Op magazine, mm -hmm. uh, which I loved and I couldn't get enough of. I remember, I think the first episode, first issue I read was like, was a microphones, there was a microphones interview and then the second interview, I was on tour. Was it an time. interview that I did? With the oh. guy at the microphone museum? Or no? No, 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 no. Uh, it was w with Phil, Phil Elvram. Oh, okay, I did an with interview with this guy, Bob Peckett, who's like a microphone expert. Yeah, which I did read. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was in like 07, yeah. your, your magical year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in 2004, which was also a great year for me because it was also a year where I had a record come out and I was touring. Like yeah. I was just on tour the entire year. The years when records came out come out are definitely like better years for me. Um, but anyway, so Tape Op worked its way into the DNA of Song Exploder too. Yeah, and I just, I loved, I loved all the stuff, all the crazy things that like the books described doing and, and stuff that the microphones and the deer hoof talking about how they didn't have multi-track recorders. They just had two tracks on a Mac. So they got four Macs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and hit Spacebar at the same space, time. Yeah, and did an eight track recording that way. Like all that stuff I loved, but the problem was you're reading it and you don't get to hear the thing that they're talking about. You know, there's like this specific example that the books was talking about with making a bass drum sound out of using like a, a speaker and a filing cabinet where they would send this like frequency through the filing cabinet and they had taken out the drawers and they put a microphone inside there to, anyway, I was just like, that sounds incredible, but I could only imagine what they were talking about. And so I had this idea that like to, to mix to take the stems of the song. So other people could basically hear the song the way that the people who make the song hear it. You know, when you make a song, you get to hear all of the cool things that you've done or tried to do, all the weird ideas, all the, all the missteps that you're just like, well, I'm just going to leave that in because that's the closest to, that snare sound is not what I wanted, but it's the closest thing to what I had in my head, you know, and, and all the ways that you try and like get that snare sound to go trying to find a way to make and let an audience hear that the way an artist does. By any measure, Song Exploder is a very successful show. Well, I don't at least know. by my measure. Yeah, I mean like that that's a Does it feel like it's a creatively successful outlet for you personally? To a limited extent. I think we we, we touched upon it a little bit earlier. It does in like making the show is really enjoyable like i like getting my hands in the pro tools making the cuts making you know making the storytelling decisions editing the whole thing taking sort of the raw material of the interview and the stems and trying to like figure out what the puzzle is to make it coherent i like all of that but ultimately like as a body of work it feels a little, i feel a little bit strange about it because it, it's never going to be wholly mine 
yeah, it's a platform for someone else. Yeah. Like this show is. Yeah. But by doing it, did it unleash some sort of creative energy that might have been dormant before? I think maybe more the opposite, actually. You know, I haven't made a record since I started doing the podcast. And I think part of that is because it's a lot easier to turn my creative energy into the short term of making an episode, the creative task of that versus the longer term thing of like trying to write a song or try and write an album because but you could surely write a song in the same amount of time as making an episode of song exploder maybe but there's but somebody's actually waiting for the episode to come out like i've made there's an accountability yeah and so, nobody's waiting for the for the 1a radio song to come out nobody but cares. how can you create that for yourself so this year so now after five years of doing song exploder i stopped hosting it and and producing it, being the main producer, I, um, and got Tao Nguyen to, do, to be the guest host, and Christian Kuhns, who, was, who had been like an intern who worked on the, the show um, for, for years, now he's producing it with the idea that I could buy myself some time and maybe I could try and work on music. Have you been writing music? I've written one song, which you heard. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and otherwise, and instead, I just ended up filling my time with other short-term creative ideas instead, like ideas for other podcasts or ideas for other kinds of shows and other kinds of projects where I'm, I'm like, like I, I just, somehow I can't quite carve out the time to be just be just just be bored enough to write music because you know I you need like a little of some percentage of boredom. Or I need some percentage right. of boredom. But uh, on the other hand, you're choosing to spend your time developing these other ideas. Yeah. And if I could guess, if you're anything like me, it's because it's less emotionally difficult to do yeah. that. And it's less personal and less vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the other part of Song Exploder is like I've gotten the chance to talk to these some you know, like unbelievable artists and it's, it just reinforces an idea that I'm not at the same level. And, and then the ne next step, this is part where it gets illogical is where I go. And therefore I shouldn't even bother trying. Like I shouldn't even bother making anything. Cause why try and write a song when, you know, like Phil Elvram is a better songwriter than I will ever be. Why even bother trying to? So how would you answer song? that question? Why? The answer is just, I don't, that's why I haven't written, written, written a song. Is that logical? Um, and what do you mean by better? Yeah. More skillful, more profound. Yeah, maybe more profound. I think that's like profundity is probably the thing that I'm trying to get towards. And so. Are you trying to get towards it? <laughs> if you're not, if you're not writing or like that, that's what I would, that's your ideal. That's what I would like. Yeah. Well, and it's you like, clearly want to do it and you've done it before. Yeah. It's part of it is like being back, willing to not be as good as somebody else for a while. Yeah. And I think and I also, look back and, and I look back at what I, now I look back at what I've done at like, like my past, if you can even call it a career, the career. My what do you music mean career. if you could even call it a career? You bought an apartment with, by yeah. making music. Like how many people do that? Yeah. How many people want to and never do? And then you've toured all over the place and made records. It, it is a career. Yeah. But if, and so anyway, if you look back, I look back at it. I mean, you're like, no doctor. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I, I look back at that stuff and I'm like, ah, it feels kind of embarrassing. Like I'm embarrassed by the, but I'm embarrassed by the real, like I look back at what felt like relative success, you know, like I never thought that I was taking over the world or anything, but I felt excited about it. And now instead it reads as like relative failure. Well, you're denying your own emotions. You know what I mean? Like you're denying the fact that it felt like success and therefore it was success. Mm. You're the one that determines that for yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. What do you want to do next? Like right after this? Well, with, what, do you, what do you see yourself doing in the next year? I wish I could say 
like making making a record, but I don't. I honestly don't see it happening. What's stopping you from doing it? I've probably I've made too many commitments already. I've kind of put a lot of barriers in in place. But then the other thing, like I I think I'm just I'm not like part of me also part of the reason why I haven't written songs like part of me worries that like I'm just I'm tapped out. <laughs> You know, like that's it. Like I had a finite number of songs, and that's it. Well, that's not true, right? Anybody? No. I I feel like any you can always write something. I but mean, there's you, always there's your, also your experience has changed. So much has happened since you've done it last. I'm arguing with myself in my head, even as I'm formulating what I'm going to. And do you say have a you? do you have a shrink? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay. Uh, and and he's great, and we argue a lot about, okay. about this stuff. But I. I, <laughs> it, it feels, yeah, it's really silly to, to think about music as like a, like the way that people think about sports, you know, right Where in sports, there's like, you know, there's, there's somebody a winner who, and a loser. Yeah. And there's someone who can run the hundred meter dash at a certain speed and whether you, and either you're faster than that person or you're slower than that person. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same with music, but somehow, and I never used to think about it that way but now somehow i like somehow that path has straightened out into this way that i do that i look at it linearly where i'm like well where am i where am i along the track and i feel like i'm so far behind i don't know it's, it's I, I guess the real thing is i just i'm like well i'm just not good at this stuff so why bother like why bother doing something that you're not good at well but there's a, a big part of you that wants to do it so that's enough right and also the, the part that says that you're not good at it might not be true. There might not be truth to that. That's, that's a hard, that's the part where I think it gets really hard. That, that like, like if you were good, if you were good at it, then maybe if I were good at it, then, then maybe people would have liked what I did more. So you but think then that I also being feel like, good has a correlation with what other people think. Right, exactly. But then I think about like what I like. Mm -hmm. And how that correlates to what people like. I'm like, I don't like the things that everybody yeah, likes. Yeah, like is Lady Gaga a superior artist to Lowe? Right, exactly. To the extent, like to the same degree that her albums sell more, yeah. her concerts? Or is, yeah. the, is it commensurate with the amount of money that she makes? Right, exactly. Like I, I don't buy that argument. And yet somehow I can, I can you also put, it on, put yeah. it on myself. And also there are people who I know told me that they like my music. And so I'm also kind of writing off their opinion. Mm-hmm. Including your wife. That's how you met your wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. She she gets really frustrated with me about all of this stuff. Is the West Wing your favorite television program? Um, it's not probably actually my number one, but but there are parts and episodes of that show that I think are as good as anything that's ever been on TV. So I should mention you also have a podcast about the West Wing, mm -hmm. which is also a successful podcast from my vantage point. I mean, didn't you just sell out a whole theater mm -hmm. in like a few hours mm -hmm. and you don't feel successful still? I mean, no, no, that's fine. But I don't, I can't really take credit for that. That's just like people like the West wing. People like drummers, but I don't know if I could sell out a whole theater <laughs> if I had like, well, it depends on who I had, I exactly, guess. But. Yeah. It depends on who you had. When I start thinking about this stuff, when I start thinking about me, the music that I'm not writing, I definitely get sad. Well, I hope that you start writing music and start doing it for your own sake. And then anything else is gravy. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's what I would like to do. That's my, that has been what I keep thinking about. It's like, how can I get back to writing the way that I used to write when playing in a basement full of 40 kids was just bliss. When I just felt like that was, when that, was the last time you felt that bliss? Do you get that same bliss from doing a great episode of Song Exploder? No. It's a different kind of satisfaction. It's a different kind of satisfaction. Yeah. That's more like I've completed a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I really like doing puzzles mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that there is a real like nice way of like things locking into place that I get a lot of satisfaction from. But it's definitely not the same thing as making something, singing about, you know, singing about something that I feel deeply and then, you know, feeling like, you're feeling like I've hurt. connected it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for completing this puzzle with me. Rishi, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I'm sorry. It was such a depressing discussion. I don't think it was. I no? think it was honest. Well, thanks so much, Joe. <laughs> 
Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs>